Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think we should probably go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Galen Henderson, uh, MD class of uh, 1993 and former uh, president of the Brown Medical Alumni Association. And I just was awarded the Brown Bear Award. Uh, for our well, they gave me a little trophy, and I, I don't know if I should make it into a big necklace or a crown. I'm trying to make a decision here. Uh, this afternoon, I am really excited to be here and delighted to introduce uh, Jack Elias, our Dean of Medicine, and the Frank L. Day Professor. So Dr. Jack Elias uh, is a former chair of medicine at Yale School of Medicine and is Brown University's seventh dean, and all of our deans are doing well. This is number seven uh, over our lifetime. Uh, and uh, he's the Dean of Medicine and Biological Sciences. Uh, in his uh, professional career, spanning more than 30 years since earning his bachelor's degree and MD from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. Elias had cared, has cared for patients with a wide variety of lung ailments and injuries and have conducted research on conditions including asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pneumonia, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, and the effects of smoking. Uh, with consistent support from NIH, uh, Dr. Elias has trained scores of young researchers and published more than 200 original peer-reviewed research papers. He has also frequently earned uh, funding from industry and private foundations and holds several patents uh, with many more pending. Dr. Elias brings uh, to Brown extensive administrative experience in academic medicine. He has directed outpatient clinics uh, and intensive care programs and other clinical services and has served on many uh, key administrative and academic committees at the Yale School of Medicine. He has served as the Chair of Medicine and Physician-in-Chief uh, at the Yale New Haven Hospital since 2006. He will be speaking to, uh, with us today about his laboratory research uh, in breakthroughs in lung disease. Dr. Elias. Thank you very much uh, for the lovely introduction. And thank you all for coming. Thank you for your love of Brown and your willingness to come inside on a, on a beautiful, unexpected summer day in the fall. Uh, uh, and for your willingness to come to Brown uh, and, and spend some time with us. I, I'm re regenerating. OK, good. So uh, when John uh, Perry asked me to talk, he asked me to talk on my research. Uh, and the title we came up with is illustrated here. But as I thought it through, it's, it's a lot more than just the research we're doing. It's also a vision for respiratory diseases at Brown, and that's something that I'm going to work in uh, uh, as we go. Uh, this is what the green looked like for those of you who didn't get to see the green at the 250th. It was a wonderful event. It's a, a once in a lifetime event. You don't get to see too many 250th uh, celebrations of, of a single institution. Um, and, and it, it is a beautiful picture, but just keep in mind, uh, we have fireworks and pyrotechnics over 200-year-old wooden buildings uh, uh, at that event. You really wonder which ER the uh, fire marshal was in uh, with the palpitations during the, during, the, <laughs> during the whole process. But for today, what I want to do is I want to start out with a little bit of background and a little bit about the scientific approach that we use. I then want to sort of take you on a tour. I'm going to take you with snapshots on the same tour that we've gone on over the years in our attempt to find new treatments for asthma. I'll tell you a little bit about asthma. I'm going to show you how the, the, we use transgenic mice to understand the role of IL-13 in asthma. And eventually, uh, we're right on the verge of a new treatment for asthma based on uh, IL-13. And I'm going to take you to what we think is the next big thing in asthma treatment, which is called chitinase-like proteins, and how that is, is a very important thing as well. But what's happened is as we've studied the chitinase-like proteins, we've come to realize that they're involved in a whole variety of other diseases. And so I'm going to give you a variety uh, of images about uh, that as well. And then I'm going to go back to Brown itself, and I'm going to talk about the strategic plan building on distinction. I'm going to talk about the part that the uh, Alpert Medical School is playing. And I'm going to talk about what we call BIRDS, which is the Brown Investigators for Respiratory Diseases, which is a group that has coalesced over the last year uh, that is a real exciting group with a real ability to make an impact. But let me first talk about what respiratory diseases are in terms of their impact in the world. 
Uh, let me impress you with number one. Respiratory infection is the number one contributor to the overall burden of disease in the world. Not cancer, not heart disease. Respiratory infection is the single biggest issue uh, in the world. A billion people suffer from chronic respiratory disease and the prevalence is increasing. Four million people die prematurely each year due to respiratory diseases. <coughs> Asthma has been called the silent epidemic. It affects 235 million people, 14% of children worldwide. And in the US, it's 8.4% of the population. That's one in every 12 people in the United States is afflicted with asthma. COPD affects about 200 million people worldwide, and we have 2 billion people at risk. The at risk thing is that in the third world, almost all women do open fire cooking, so they're standing over a fire while they cook all day long, and that is one of the major risk factors for developing emphysema in the third world. It is the fourth leading cause of death in the world, and is soon going to be the third leading cause of death in the world. And lung cancer accounts for 1.4 million deaths each year, and unfortunately, the prevalence of lung cancer is increasing as well. Now, when you look at these diseases and you try to understand them and try to find ways of, uh, of, of treating them, you quickly get brought into a paradigm of injury and repair. Everybody in this room, as you breathe, is breathing air into your lungs, but you're also bringing all kinds of particles in your lungs. All sorts of things that shouldn't be down in your lungs get brought down in your lungs. They cause injury responses, and in a normal, healthy person, you're able to clear them and you're able to repair. So in normals, injury is controlled and repair responses are appropriately balanced. This leaves you with healthy wound healing. You don't even know that you have anything going on in your lungs. And you can clear infections without even knowing that you're actually infected. On the other hand, when this injury and repair paradigm is not regulated properly, you can get chronic inflammation, loss of lung tissue, COPD, there are big holes in the lung where people just don't have lung tissue anymore. Or you can get an overly exuberant injury and repair response and you can replace normal tissue with scar tissue which doesn't function to transfer oxygen and do what it's supposed to do. Or you can even set the stage for cancer. So the focus we've had over the, the, the last uh, 20, 25 years has been to study injury and repair. How does the lung get injured? And how does that injury repair itself in normal people? And then what goes wrong in people that actually have disease? And the way we do it is we like to generate uh, information in mice. We like genetically modified mice, and I'll show you that in a second. And we, we follow this as far as we can in mice, and we basically try to reproduce human diseases in mice. We then take the information we found and we bring it back to man. This is my lab group from about 10 years ago. You test out what you've found, you go as far as you can in man, you generate new questions and you go back to mice and you keep going back and forth in this cyclical fashion to give you the kind of information that you want, but to always know that the things you're studying in the modeling system, in the mouse, is actually relevant to the human disease. So let's talk about what the human lung looks like. If, if normal people had a biopsy, this is a normal human airway. Here is your airway lumen. For those of you who have never looked at an airway before, this surface layer of cells right here are the epithelial cells. This is what normal epithelial cells look like. This little group of cells right here are the cells that make mucus. Those of you who have any kind of condition that brings up mucus or you have friends with asthma or COPD, those are the cells uh, that are doing it. So this is what a normal airway looks like. Compare that to this picture. This is what I call my slide of sadness. This is not a biopsy. This is an autopsy specimen. This is an autopsy specimen of an 11-year-old girl who lived in the New Haven area uh, uh, in Connecticut, had by all rights mild to moderate asthma, was having a bad day at school. The school nurse called her mom. The mom put her in the car, was driving her to the doctor's office, and she had what's called sudden asphyxic death and she died in the car on the way to the doctor's office. You look at this and you see how completely different this is than the picture I just showed you a second ago. 
You have massive inflammation around the airway. All these little blue dots are inflammatory cells that have come in. You also see a big plug of mucus sitting in the center of this airway blocking what the air movement. And you see other areas where the structure just looks different. And if you look at them closely, you'll see that you have inflammation. You have airway scarring right down around the, uh, in the subepithelial region. You have this mucus response right here. And you can't see it on this stain, but you have increase in blood vessels as well. This is what asthma looks like. This is what students of asthma are trying to understand, trying to control, trying to figure out which of these responses may contribute to the symptoms that our, our patients experience. <laughs> to go any further, though, I have to t uh, bring up one concept. You're going to hear me use the word cytokines on and off during this talk. A cytokine is a small protein that is an intracellular messenger between cells. Cytokines are made by one group of cells. They travel to receptors on other cells. They bind to the receptor, as in this cartoon illustration, and then they do something to that cell. It turns out that the type of cytokine that's produced and uh, the responses that cytokines produce play a key role uh, in asthma. So what is that process? I'm going to summarize a whole big body of work to say that people have gone from the belief that asthma is a disease of muscles in the airway to a belief that asthma is a disease characterized by chronic inflammation of the airway. And, and this is a big change. It's a change over about the last 15 years in terms of what we believe is going on in asthma. And what's very clear is that there's a specific kind of a cytokine in the airway of asthmatics. It's called a type 2 cytokine. And here are the type 2 cytokines, interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-13, and interleukin-9. This concept came up in the early 1990s, but nobody could go any further. Nobody could figure out what the cytokines were from this list and how they were contributing to the development of asthma. We got in the, the asthma research world at around that time, and we realized that we hadn't been doing it right. What, what had happened in the late 80s and early 90s is a number of very celebrated drugs were produced with the idea that they were going to be wonderful treatments for asthma, and when they were brought into the clinic, they failed miserably. And people didn't understand why, and we thought we had a very simple explanation, is that they were targeting the wrong part of the immune response. We believed they needed to target uh, these cytokines, particularly these Th2 cytokines, and one of the ways we proved it was by producing transgenic mice. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room spends most of their waking hours thinking about transgenic mice, but just in case there are a couple people who don't think about transgenic mice routinely, let me tell you what a transgenic mouse is and how you then make a mouse that gives you information about a disease. To make a transgenic mouse, you take a female mouse, you mate it with a male mouse. You wash the fertilized eggs out of the oviduct. You then take your gene of interest and you inject it into the pronucleus of this egg. You then take this egg and you put it back into the uterus of what's called a pseudo-pregnant female mouse. This is a female mouse that has been mated with a vasectomized male mouse. Hormonally, she's acting as if she's pregnant. She literally gets pregnant when you put the eggs in her uterus. She then carries these eggs to term and she has a litter of pups. Some of them have the gene that you put in and some of them don't have the gene that you put in, and you figure it out by clipping off a little piece of, of, of tissue and extracting the DNA. This one's transgenic, this one's not. These two are transgenic, Th these two are not. So you have identical mice born on, on the same day from the same mom, exposed to the exact same in, uh, environment that differ only in the one gene that you put into that <coughs> mouse. And that allows you to ask some very fundamental, but some very, very powerful questions. The fundamental question you can ask is, if I take this gene and I express it in the lung of a mouse, do, you, do I get anything at all that looks like a human disease? Because if you get something that looks like a human disease, you might actually have something that makes sense in terms of being involved. 
uh, in the human disease. So we made um, transgenic mice using the techniques that I showed you, looking at a molecule called interleukin-13, which I just showed you, is one of the major TH2 cytokines. At the time, it was a poor cousin. No one knew much about it. No one cared much about it. People thought it actually that it was a genetic duplication uh, and, and maybe was a, a redundant molecule. What we showed, here you have a lung from a, a non-transgenic mouse, and here you have a lung from a transgenic mouse. Look at the nice doily-like structure of a regular lung. Look at what this lung from a transgenic mouse looks like. You've got massive inflammation. You've got macrophages here. That's what these big cells are. They're kind of juiced up. The arrow's pointing to a particular kind of cell called an eosinophil, which we'll talk about more later. But this is the classic kind of cell that you see when you have this type 2 response that I told you about. And then you have these crystals here that we, we thought were beautiful, but we didn't know much more about them. Here are some other views of what the lungs look like. This is called a Congo red stain. Each of these reddish brown cells is an eosinophil. These are the classic cells in asthmatic sputum. This is a, a, a cardinal feature of this response. And then there are these crystals. We didn't know what these crystals were. But the, if you talk to any second year medical student, they'll tell you that there are things called charcoal laden crystals in the sputum of, asthma, excuse me, of asthmatics. And that's what we thought they were. We turned out to be totally wrong. This is another stain. This is a mucus stain. It's called a PAS stain. Here is your control mouse lung. And look at this one. All these purple cells here, all these reddish purple cells, are filled with mucus. Asthmatics will tell you all the time that they have trouble clearing their mucus. They have a thing called bronchorrhea, and, and they're constantly bringing up mucus. This is the reason why. They have this thing called mucus metaplasia and goblet cell hyperplasia uh, that is what you see right here. And the other thing that we saw in these, this is a trichrome stain. So everything that's blue is collagen. It's fibrous tissue. It's scar tissue. This is the, the wild type mice. Here are the transgenic mice, low power, high power. Ignore the top, top two and look at the bottom. You see a little bit of wispy blue collagen here, and then you see a lot of scar tissue here going down into the adventitia. So with one gene, by putting one gene in a mouse lung, we've reproduced the inflammation, we've reproduced the mucus response, we've reproduced the eosinophils, and now we've reproduced the fibrosis. We've, in essence, with a single gene in a lung, reproduced the cardinal features of human asthma, which got us very, very excited. And what happened was that our studies led to studies from our group and other groups doing the same examinations in human tissues and to the realization that there is a very impressive abnormality in IL-13 in asthma, and it led eventually <coughs> to a new class of drugs. These are antibodies against IL-13. This is the paper that came out just a little while ago that actually proves that if you neutralize IL-13, it's therapeutically effective in human asthma. So we've gone from a mouse discovery through to humans and now through to a new therapeutic agent uh, in asthma, which has got us, uh, got us very, very happy and very excited. Now, the, the next big question is, how is this happening? How is IL-13 doing what it's doing? And one of the things that we kept seeing in our lungs are these crystals. And the people in my lab kept saying to me, Jack, we have to study the crystals. I kept saying, we know what the crystals are. They're charcoal-laden crystals. Every second year medical student knows that. We're not going to get anything useful out of it. They kept saying, but they're so beautiful. And they really are. They're, they're, they're so beautiful. Um, and so finally, I turned to, to the folks in my lab and I said, if you want to study these crystals, you study these crystals at night or on the weekend. Don't do them on my time, do them on your time. I figured I'd never hear another word about it, and that would be the end of it. About a month later, I got a call from one of the core facilities which uh, 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 did, took, took proteins and sequenced them and said, Dr. Elias, we've got the results of your sample. I said, what sample? They said, the crystal protein that you came from your lab. I said, we sent you a sample? They said, yeah, you sent us a sample. I said, okay, what was the result? They said, it's a chitinase. I said, what's a chitinase? They said, it chews up chitin. I said, what's chitin? 
And, and we had this great conversation that kept going round and round, and we weren't getting very far. And finally they said, Dr. Elias, we have all the solutions. Everything you need is gonna come to you in the next email. And I said, wow. They, they sequence your protein, and at the same time, they do your, 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 your homework for you. Really great. So I waited, the email came, I opened it up, and they were right. They sent me a map of the campus with a big red circle around the library. That was their way of saying, go do your own work, go to the library, and leave us alone. <laughs> and so, so we went to the library, all right? And so let me tell you what we found. We found, as, as they said, we had a chitinase. What are chitinases? Chitinases are molecules that chew up chitin. What is chitin? Chitin is a long sugar. It's a repeating sugar. The technical term is it's a polymer of what's called a beta 1,4 N-acetyl glucosamine. But to put it in some perspective, cellulose, we're talking wood and paper, is the number one polysaccharide in nature. This is the number two polysaccharide in nature. And where do you find it? You find it in the exoskeleton of crustaceans and insects, the walls of fungi, uh, and a variety of other pathogens, things that when they infect you are bad. And to give the New England analogy, which I ought to do when I'm at Brown, it's the stuff in the lobster shell that makes the lobster shell hard. When the lobster makes chitinases, you become a soft shell lobster, and that's how the lobster molts. The New York analogy, anybody here from New York? The New York analogy is it's the stuff in the cockroach that goes crunch when you step on it. <laughs> so so the, it's still the, the coating, the, the protective coating uh, of the process. And we had stumbled into a gene family called the 18 glycosyl hydrolases. Very poorly understood, nobody knew much about it. All that was really known was that there were some members of this family that literally took this big sugar and made it into small sugars chewed it up enzymatically. And then there are others that bound to the sugar and didn't do anything. The one we got really interested in that I'm gonna to talk to you about here is this molecule that has multiple names. It's called breast regression protein 39, YKL40, or chitinase 3 like one. We're gonna to try to use chitinase 3 like one uh, in the process, and that's the one we're gonna talk about more as we go. And one of the first things we did is we set up a way to measure this protein. And we worked, uh, this is Dr. Jeff Chupp, who is my, one of my former trainees and subsequently a collaborator uh, down at Yale. And Jeff and I asked a very simple question. Can you measure chitinase 3 like 1 in the blood? And is it normal or abnormal in asthma? Turns out you can easily measure chitinase 3 like 1 in the blood. In fact, everybody in this room has buckets literally buckets of this protein floating around in your blood every day. And what's shocking is, and until recently, nobody had any idea what this protein did. But what's also interesting is you look at asthmatics, and there's some that are normal, and then you've got this group here that are really, really elevated levels of this floating around in their blood. What's, <coughs> what's unique about that group when you break the asthmatics down, mild asthma, moderate asthma, or severe asthma, that's where this group is. And so what we had on our hands is a marker that allows us to differentiate mild asthma from severe asthma and a subpopulation of asthmatics from controls. And the other thing that was really neat is we worked with a variety of, of, of colleagues, particularly Carol Ober from the University of Chicago. Carol has been studying a population uh, of people called the Hutterites who live in an agrarian, inbred population. Uh, it's either in South Dakota or North Dakota. It's in one of the Dakotas. And she's been studying them for 35 years. The beauty of this group is that they all live in an identical environment. If one gets a new car, everybody gets a new car. If one gets a new tractor, everybody gets a new tractor. It's kind of like a modern Amish kind of setting. And they've been studying their genes for a long, long time. And what we found was that, that even in that inbred population, there are things called polymorphisms. These are individual to individual variations. So you might have slightly different sequence for your chitinase 3-like 1 gene than someone else in this room. And so the question is, do, do these changes actually have any impact on asthma in any way? And what we found was that there are specific variations that correlate with higher levels of chitinase 3-like 1. Remember the severe asthmatics that I just showed you? 
that correlate with increased prevalence of asthma or allergy, and they correlate with worse lung function. So we now have proof at the, at the population level and at the genetic level that there's this very strong association between chitinase 3 like 1 and asthma. But we were left in the situation where everybody would say, but what does it do? How is it doing this? How can this possibly be? And to test that, we went back to the mouse. And we had wild type mice that contained <coughs> chitinase 3 like 1. And we had mice that we genetically engineered to have no chitinase 3 like 1 gene. We took the gene out. So they are what's called chitinase 3 like 1 null mice. And they lack chitinase 3 like 1. You then challenge them both with an, any one of a variety of models of human asthma that you can do in the mouse. And then you look at inflammation, cytokine production, and cell survival, and you see, are there differences between this mouse and this mouse that tell you what this gene is absolutely doing and what it's required to do? And the answer was a profound yes. And that is that in the absence of the gene, when you had mice that didn't make chitinase 3 like 1, that type 2 response that I showed you was almost gone. They could not mount a type 2 inflammatory response. So that they had very significantly decreased lung inflammation, very significantly decreased Th2 cytokine production. Remember we talked about the Th2 cytokines? And they had very impressive decreases in the survival of lymphocytes and eosinophils. And this turns out to be a major part of the story. What these molecules do, one of the major things they do, is they control cell death. They determine if a cell dies or a cell doesn't die under a whole variety of circumstances that I'm glad to talk to, to people about later. But when you look at this and you add this to the human data, what it's telling you is you not only have a biomarker of asthma, you not only have an asthma risk factor gene, you now also know that it is a therapeutic target in asthma. And as you'll see uh, in a couple slides, the NIH has agreed with us and it wants us to turn this into a drug, hopefully in the next five years. So that was really very exciting. We were thrilled by these results and, and, and it clearly told us that excess chitinase 3 like 1 is, is not necessarily good for you. If you have asthma, it ought to be controlled. What was shocking to us is that once you make these genetically modified mice, you do a whole mess of things with them. One of the things we did, Charles de la Cruz, uh, a former fellow, gave them pneumococcal pneumonia, a totally different insult. Pneumococcal pneumonia is the most common form of pneumonia in the world. What you see here is this is the wild type mouse. This is the chitinase null mice, the knockout mice, and they die sooner. So this is now the exact opposite of what I showed you for asthma where it's bad. In this setting, it's actually good. And that puzzled us, that left us scratching our heads. And in fact, it left us thinking we were at this stop, very famous stoplight in Paris, uh, not quite knowing where to go, how to proceed, uh, and, and what the process was. But then one day, I was hiking uh, my favorite trail at one of the local state parks. All of a sudden, the wind blew, the clouds parted, the sun came in, and all of a sudden, it made sense. What did it make sense? It made sense if you go back and say, OK, what is the most important way to clear pathogens? Remember, chitin is in pathogens. What you want is if, if you're the divine creator, you're, you're the master organizer of the universe, you want to be able to take bacteria like these little blue dots here. You want them to be gobbled up by cells called macrophages and killed. You want to then mount what's called an innate response, which is the response that every one of us has built into us. It's hardwired into us to control those bacteria. But you don't want too much of it because you don't want to kill local tissue. You don't want the, the treatment to be worse than the disease. You want to quickly go to adaptive immunity, like this type 2 response we've been talking about. And then you want to heal or you want to wall off. You want to form an abscess if you need to, or you'd like to just heal the tissue on its own. When you look at what chitinase 3 like 1 does, it controls this process by controlling survival of macrophages. It actually controls the innate response. 
uh, and uh, allows you to mount it, but it doesn't get overwhelming, so it doesn't kill local lung tissue. It moves you quickly to this adaptive immune response, which is the one that's exaggerated in asthma. And then it gives you this walling off or healing effect. And so what we now have as our hypothesis that's on the table, which we've been now testing for years and every test so far has been right on, that this molecule is a master regulator of human antipathogen responses, of a whole variety of human antipathogen responses. And to us, that's a very, very exciting thing. And evolutionarily, it fits very well because these molecules exist all the way from bacteria through plants all the way through up into humans. Now that being said, how does it do it? And I don't expect anybody to, to, to memorize this or no, no, there will be a quiz. John Perry will be quizzed at the end of the day. <laughs> but <clears throat> but um, what, what we found, the question is how does it do it? At the time, no, there's no enzymatic activity. The question is, are there receptors? And the answer is yes, there are at least two receptor complexes. We described this one, it's got multiple components to it, uh, and there's a second one as well. And so we clearly now have a whole new regulatory system and a whole new set of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, receptors that we can potentially manipulate for human disease. And if you put the story together for man, we've now moved over the last couple of years to look at this in man in a whole variety of ways. What's very clear is that it's a, a, when, when you turn in, everybody needs this. You want to have this. When it's appropriately turned on, it's a protective response after infection or injury where it contributes to disease resistance and tolerance. On the other hand, if you make it inappropriately or it's inappropriately elevated, it can contribute to disease via a whole variety of mechanisms. And then there are diseases where you don't make it. We've now found two diseases where the people just can't make it, and that's why they get into trouble. So as I said, we've been looking at a whole variety of diseases, and it's allowed us to come up in humans with a classification of a whole variety of diseases based on this chitinase three like one axis. There are diseases where it's increased and the axis is activated. I've given you asthma as an example. There's a, a disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's involved in metastatic lung cancer, primary lung cancer, obesity. My wife is very excited about this. She made me promise when we got married, I would eventually develop an anti-fatness pill. Uh, <laughs> and so maybe we'll, we'll be on the way. Uh, it's involved in coronary artery disease, and it's involved in a disease you may or may not have heard of, but it's becoming a huge disease in the, in the GI world, which is called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is a <coughs> disease where the liver accumulates fat, and people don't understand why, why that's actually happening. So you've got all these diseases that theoretically can be controlled by controlling this process. You've got a whole, you've got two diseases now where you don't make it. One of them is bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and I'm going to show you more about that in a second. The other is the acute exacerbation of, a, of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And we've just recently discovered that there are now diseases where those receptors that I showed you don't go where they're supposed to go. These are genetic diseases. They're very rare, but they're very educational. And one of them is called hermansky pudlak syndrome. Let me give you a couple examples just to whet your appetite about where this may go. This is, uh, these are serum samples and we're measuring chitinase three like one and we're looking at healthy people and we're looking at stage four melanoma patients. These are people who have had melanoma skin cancers and they've had metastases. Again, here's your normal group and look at this. You've got this big subpopulation of people that have met uh, uh, very, very high levels. Turns out they correlate with extensive metastatic disease and it's not just that it's correlating with extensive metastatic disease. I'm showing you here that if you block chitinase 3 like 1, you can control metastatic disease to the lung. Here we've given this mouse melanoma cells by vein. Every one of these black dots is a tumor. It's a uh, ma malignant melanoma in the lung. Here we gave them the antibody to chitinase 3 like 1. And look at the difference, a humongously impressive difference in terms of whether you get metastatic disease. 
Here are the pulmonary fibrosis patients, normal people and people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, normal people and this genetic disease called hermansky pudlak syndrome. And you see again, normals and these fibrotic lung diseases, there again is a subpopulation in both where you see a very big increase in the levels in the circulation. And in both cases, the, these are the people that have rapidly progressive disease and get into a lot of trouble. And what we've now figured out in those diseases is that chitinase 3 like 1 is produced as a protective response in response to injury. It's produced and it's shutting off injury, which is what you'd want to do. You cut your finger, you want to stop cells from dying. At the same time, it's augmenting fibroproliferative repair, but somehow it's not doing it adequately. And it's doing this via these two receptors. And we now know that the genetic defect in chitinase, in, in the hermansky pudlak syndrome is right here. And that this receptor doesn't get to the cell surface uh, and doesn't allow this process to work. Let me show you one last example. This is a premature baby. Uh, many, many people in the room here are old enough to remember that when you had a premature baby years and years ago, it was really a problem. One of the biggest problems for premature babies is are their lungs ready to breathe air from the aqueous environment that they come from in the mother's womb? And uh, about a decade ago, we realized if we put surfactant into the lungs of these premature babies, many of them did very well. On the other hand, we still have a group of babies that are born prematurely. They have to be put on a ventilator, as you can see right here, and their lungs aren't mature enough. They get the surfactant, and they're still not mature enough, and they get a disease called bronchopulmonary dysplasia. No one's been able to figure out why. No one's been able to understand why these kids don't get better, and a seemingly identical kid gets better. Here's one of the reasons. The kids that don't get BPD make this protective molecule very well. The kids that get BPD or die don't make it. And so this raises it that you can diagnose whether the kid's at risk or not. And it also suggests that if you give recombinant version of this chitinase 3 like one you may actually be able to prevent BPD uh, in these kids. So I've given you a glimpse about many of the things that we do uh, in the lab, but let me now bring it back to Brown. That's why you're all here. You're all uh, people who love Brown and, uh, and have had uh, a warm experience at Brown. As you know, the, the plan that Chris Paxson has put forth is called Building on Distinction. It's got an integrative scholarship theme. There are two major planks that fit in the medical school. One is using science and technology to improve lives. And the other is deciphering disease and improving population health. And the medical school is actively working on these to fit into the, the overall Brown plan. Uh, and, and in thinking about what we should do, we came across this picture. For those of you who have never seen it before, these are silos. From the back of the room, it might look like a very actively functioning farm. But when you get real close, you see that the farm is a little bit on the decrepit side. And you also see that each one of these silos is totally separate from the other. There's no interaction between the silos. What's very clear uh, is that you look at academic medical centers around the world, they're structured in silos. Uh, we, we do not have our research, our clinical care, and our education appropriately integrated, so our missions are dissociated, our training is not integrated, and our research does not generate the desired results uh, for our patients. So we've come up with a plan for how to restructure Brown and restructure the medical school to take advantage of the, sci the, uh, of, of the science that's going on here and to get rid of the silos. And we call them horizontally integrated research and education teams. And what we do is we take the group and we integrate them on a continuum, which is what that red band is. The continuum can be a disease. The continuum can be a mechanism of diseases. The continuum can be a biologic pathway. The continuum can be a societal problem, such as aging, obesity, and all the various things that we as a society uh, are, are facing. We develop people who work in basic discovery areas. We develop people who provide clinical care to 
do patient cohort research, translational research, and these two groups will worry about going back and forth with concepts to figure out disease relevant. We then have folks that bring things out to society and populations and policy. We have other structures that are involved in commercialization. And what we want is that at every step of the way, interactions between these groups will give us synergy, will give us uh, dy dynamism that we really need to be able to address these many problems. And we also want to take every one of these steps along this continuum and use it for undergraduate, graduate, and medical education uh, because we believe it's a very exciting thing for a student to be able to go all the way from basic discovery all the way through clinical care uh, and disease uh, application. So how have we done this? We've established, we're in the process of establishing the Brown Institute for Translational Sciences. And it's got new programs and departments, and I won't go through all of them uh, today, although you see number two here is respiratory diseases. It is populated by our basic science departments and our clinical departments. It leads to new educational programs, and it interacts with a new group that I won't talk much about today, but I'm happy to talk to others later, called Brown Biomedical Innovations, Inc., which is a way of getting uh, programs out, getting new companies formed, getting licensing agreements, getting discoveries out into the clinic uh, uh, as, as quickly as possible. And one of the ones that has already congealed very nicely is the Brown Investigators of Respiratory Diseases. We call it BIRDS, and it, the, the program is called the BIRDS program. And what you've got is over 40 MDs and PhD at Brown and our affiliated hospitals and the Providence VA that are already working together. They already contain an impressive basic clinical and translational expertise. We have <coughs> immense expertise in asthma, immense expertise in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, world-class sleep apnea, pulmonary hypertension, and immense expertise in bronchopulmonary dysplasia, just to name a couple uh, of the groups that have <coughs> congealed uh, within this larger group. And we've already had early success. We were able to recruit Barry Shea from the Mass General Hospital at Harvard Medical School to come in and run the interstitial lung disease program. One of the major attractions to him was to come in and be part uh, of this BIRDS operation. And we've already gotten some very large NIH grants. We got what's called a COPER grant for training young people in pulmonary uh, research. Uh, and I'm happy to say my grant just got what's called a Cadet II grant, which came from the NIH. This is a grant where they pick 10 projects in the United States. And the goal of these, uh, of these grants is to take something that they think ought to be pushed quickly to being a drug and to provide funds to allow you to make it into a drug, to make it into a new therapy. And what they want us to do is develop antibodies against chitinase 3 like 1, which I've just talked to you about, as a therapeutic for asthma. And we are actively working on it. It's a, literally about two weeks old. Uh, and there's a whole buzz of new licensing agreement, uh, new talks of spin-offs, and so on. It's become a very exciting time as this group uh, has congealed and all the synergies uh, that are, were there all along have now begun uh, to work out. So I hope I've convinced you that mice are neat. I hope I've convinced you that it's even more neat when you combine mice and birds. Uh, you never know what you can do uh, when you put them together. As I say to the folks in my lab, you never know what you'll find until you look, but, you, but you've got to look in the right place. Thank you for coming. I'm more than happy to answer questions. response that I have shown you. Uh, you know, every response that we have in our body is theoretically there because it does something good for us. It's when they malfunction, uh, they get produced or turned on inappropriately or such that they actually contribute to disease. 
you, you, you would say if all the type 2 response does is to give you asthma, then why would the body have retained, evolutionarily retained type 2 responses over time? The answer is these type 2 responses are absolutely essential to fight off parasites. That's what they are, and you can imagine if you go back you know, uh, to caveman and cavewoman, fighting off parasites was uh, a big deal. And you know, if you, the price you paid was a little bit of wheezing, it was much better than having the parasite you know, consume you. Uh, so, so that's what the type 2 response does. What's very interesting is if you look in very parasite-rich areas where people are not rich and don't have shoes and don't have things that prevent parasites from coming in, is that they have activated type 2 responses, but they don't have as much asthma. And that's what you're getting at, and that's the theory behind it, is if you can get that type 2 response to get busy fighting, fighting off the parasite, maybe it would stop fighting with itself and stop fighting with you uh, and do what it's supposed to be doing. So that's the logic behind it. And there is some you know, debate, and there are these anecdotal cases where people claim that it's actually helped. Uh, but you know, we're still working to try to understand this whole process. Do you think that if you take the the drug that you're trying to develop, and you, it was to work, that the people who received it, the asthmatics who received it, would then be more susceptible to pneumonia. Well, that's a, that's a concern about every drug that you ever make, because everything that you do has a potential cost. You know, if you, you, you know, turn on your TV and you see the advertisements for anti-tumor necrosis factor treatments for rheumatoid arthritis, and then they have the little fine print on the thing at the end that talks about lymphoma and talks about tuberculosis and so on. Every drug we give patients has side effects. The real trick is going to be, is that a target which if you target it, will cause unacceptable side effects where the side effect outweighs the benefit or will it be a mild side effect? The one thing I'd put on the table though is that I showed you all the pictures where there are people with normal levels and people with high levels. I don't think, unlike many of the things you have to do to cure a cancer, I don't think you have to take this down to zero. I think you will be able to take it into the normal range, which would allow you to fight off a pathogen, but at the same time dampen the asthma response. Uh, and I think most people who have looked at this believe that that's the case. So, so the answer is we don't know. We have to test it. but. Uh, we're pretty comfortable that that is not going to be the case. And I can tell you that these known mice that we've made, they don't get infected. They sit in the animal room with all the other mice and they don't spontaneously come down with infections, which is often a, a good a sort of early test of whether you've done something so uh, uh, bad that you really don't want to go any further uh, in terms of trying to do it in man. So if research like this at Brown leads to the development of successful drugs, can Brown potentially benefit financially? Oh, for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You ever hear of Gatorade? Gatorade was the physiology department at, at, uh, at uh, Florida, Florida State, one of the two. Um, and they were looking for, they were looking at what's the, what's the electrolyte composition of people exercising in the hot Florida sun and how do you replace it so that their athletes would do better on, on, on football day. And they developed Gatorade and Gatorade has gone out and been a huge boondoggle for them. When you work in the kind of environment that we're in, the patents that come out of this stuff from people who are working at a university stays with the university. The inventor has rights, but the patent itself is held by the university. And we're dreaming that we'll have a hundred of them, hundred Gatorades, all giving resources to Brown to allow Brown to use in whatever way uh, it needs, uh, it, it sees fit. That would be such a wonderful outcome that we'd, we'd all be smiling for a very long period of time. a home run, okay, and the drug you develop is going to revolutionize children and adults with moderate to severe asthma, essentially eliminating ICU care, the use of steroids, and all of that. What is Wow, you, you don't have high standards, do you? <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, to me, that's, that's, that's great. what we want to so do. So far, it sounds great. Okay. Go ahead. Where does Brown anticipate the funding of this drug to the general population, given that pretty much any new revolutionary drug is put on either third tier or denied by most
most insurance companies, including medical assistance. Well, okay, so so. So how me, would you envision taking it? Yeah, first from off, lab I, to I would I would well let me. Let me do that last little piece first. Of how do you get? So we just got this grant from from the NIH. The grant is basically the equivalent of Uncle Sam saying, "This is one of the top ten projects that we can see to make a new drug that's going to help people in an area where we need new drugs." They're putting in over five years, five million dollars. They completely understand that that's just going to wet the whistle uh, of what it's going to take to make this come all the way to being a therapeutic uh, that's going to be out in, uh, in the population. They, one of the things they want to see us do during this time is to develop relationships with some venture capital group or with an existing pharmaceutical company uh, and get them to invest as well and to be able to have Brown license this intellectual property uh, and all the patents and such to the company so that the company is able uh, to then get investments and so on and move forward uh, and, and do what has to get done to take it uh, uh, all the rest of the way. Um, in terms of will it ever be accepted if it does get through the FDA and so on, that depends on cost, that depends on efficacy. If it's marginally effective and it's much, much more expensive than anything that we have now, it's not going to get there. Right, but but if it's revolutionarily effective, uh, when you start looking at the cost of the hospitalizations, I didn't, I, took, I didn't have it on the first slide, the number is something like $20 billion a year is spent in the U.S. on health care related to asthma. When you take hospitalizations, drugs, all the things that are involved, um, you know, all you need to do is talk to anybody who you know is a school nurse. They'll tell you that when they go in in the morning, that one of the first things they do is they take out all the inhalers and they make sure that they know which inhaler belongs to which kid and who takes how many puffs of what at what time because that's one of the biggest problems that they're dealing with every day and every day they have a larger number of inhalers sitting in front of them. We've gone from 5.2 percent of the population having asthma in the U.S. in about 1990 to 1995 to over 8 percent now in 2014. That's a pretty spooky number. That's a pretty spooky trend. It's telling us we need something more than we have to, to try to handle this disease. I hope that helps. Well, I'm a practicing pediatrician, and I will tell you it's a battle every day getting kids their appropriate therapy for families who don't have a lot of means. And one of the things we battle with insurance companies is escalation of treatment for kids who don't do do well with step one, you need step yeah, two, yeah. and then no, I keep going to the point where the paperwork is crushing. Yes, and yeah. in the kids in the medical assistance population, it doesn't matter how much paperwork you fill out, you keep getting denied. And I, I totally understand. You know. my, my, dream, my dream would be that this is so effective that the need to give it is not questioned. It's just a matter of, then you bring it into the world of public health and other things in terms of how do you get it to where it needs to be to have the, the, the most impact. And I, I, I totally understand what you're saying, and uh, uh, I agree. Are there any other, okay, see there in the back. A few questions, actually. Uh, first is patients, do you see increased levels in patients with COPD? And the other question is, do you find this chitinase and other, you know, other tissues besides the lung, uh, you know, in other organ systems? Okay, so, so there is an increase in chitinase 3 like 1 and COPD, and we're literally working now to figure out what it's doing in that setting, uh, and whether it's picking out the, a subpopulation of people with, a, with COPD that have an asthma-like disease on top of their COPD. Uh, and it may very well be that that's the group that it has there. There's always been this controversy in the pulmonary world uh, and in the allergy world about whether COPD and asthma are completely separate or whether they have an overlap. And uh, I've always been a believer in what's called the Dutch hypothesis, which is that there's an overlap. Uh, and we think that that may be the case. But we also think it may be controlling the rate of progression of COPD. Um, uh, there are other cousin molecules of chitinase 3 like one that are massively abnormal in COPD, and we're just now beginning to try to figure out uh, uh, what they do. Uh, the lung is not the only tissue that makes it. Uh, one of the tissues that makes chitinase 3 like one is the kidney. 
Another one is fat. For some reason, the fat cells make it. And in fact, a high fat diet drives chitinase 3 like 1 up. Uh, we just found that out just recently. So when you go to McDonald's and you get that double Whopper with cheese, your chitinase 3 like 1 levels go up. That's higher. That's higher. That's higher. That's higher. That's higher. That's higher. Well, what's very clear is that, is that there's a huge, immensely powerful correlation in, in man between asthma and obesity. If you look at the studies of all studies where they're trying to study refractory asthmatics, they can't control the population properly because the controls are all slim and the asthmatics are all heavy. And it's not as simple as, well, they all got steroids so they all became fat. There's much more to it than that. And we now have evidence that when you knock out this gene, you change fat in a very impressive way. And chitinase 3-like 1 may actually be the link between asthma and obesity in severe asthma. So in this world of genomics now and, and gene you know, um, identity, where does this enzyme fit in the, the, gene, the genome? Um, it, uh, this chitinase 3 like 1 is on chromosome 1, is that, is that your question? So, but in, in terms of quantitating expression, the gene is there, but there are other genes that talk about oh, how, of the amounts that it's Oh, so, so how is it controlled? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I, I didn't talk about that today, but we have a, a paper that's now uh, uh, under review where we've, we've discovered a very novel series of pathways that seem to control this. Clearly, IL-13 can stimulate this, so this Th2 cytokine response can bring it on. But there are things that are totally independent of the Th2 cytokine response that bring it on. And in fact, there is this very impressive relationship between a molecule, which you may or may not have heard of, called semaphorin 7A. Semaphorin 7A is a molecule that most people study in the nervous system because it tells neurons how to hook up with each other and form circuits. It turns out it may help inflammatory cells hook up with each other and figure out how to, how to tie in with each other. It also appears to be a driver uh, of this pathway. Uh, th it, there's a very complicated way that it interacts with its two receptors and regulates kinase 3 like 1. So that's just one of the ways. I think we're, you know, we're at the very beginning of this. You know, when we first started this, nobody knew what these molecules did. Nobody knew where they were. No one had any reason to believe that they were anything but, but epiphenomena. And it's turned out that there is a really fundamental system in the body that is clearly very important uh, for normal people. And then when it goes wrong, it clearly contributes to a whole mess of diseases. Very good whether, question. Is it ringer? It's um, <laughs> a great question. Wonderful question. Um, and yeah. whether the quote anti-aging um, discoveries, so like sirtuins and resveratrol and <laughs> all these other things, whether those things factor into it as well, can you change? Great I question. Mean, great question. Sirtuins are turning out to be yeah, they are huge they are. regulators of yeah. lots of different yeah. things, Absolutely. especially as people age. So, so it's very clear now in math that as we age, chitinase 3 like 1 goes up. Uh, no one quite knows what it's doing, but you can imagine that as we age, we all accumulate injuries. We all accumulate all sorts of uh, little injuries here, little injuries there. And it's going up because it's trying to shut those injury responses down. Um, what is very clear is that it's also a regulator. The only, the only sirtuin we've looked at so far is sirtuin 1, but it clearly regulates sirtuin 1. And there are, there's reason to believe that chitinase 3 like 1 is going to be involved in the control of aging in, in a very impressive way. Uh, and it's an area that we're just beginning to get into. Uh, uh, the, the problem with doing the aging studies is having mice that are a year to a year and a half old before you can start to study them, you have to have you know, a Fortune 500 company paying your mouse bills uh, so, so, so that you can actually do the studies that you want to do because it costs so much <laughs> to do them. But, but your questions are, are spot on, spot on. Is there an opening in your lab for something like this? <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any other questions?
If not, thank you, and thank you for all.